Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey, and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. From nursing to dairy farming in the burn, Deirdre McMahon joins us to give insight into how they have achieved 18 tonnes of grass grown in the west of Ireland and the importance of always learning and upskilling to meet the challenges of dairy farming. I um, grew up on a suckler farm in West Clare in a parish called Kalimer. Um, my parents originally would have sold a uh, dairy quota in the early 90s, so I vaguely remember milking cows in, in Kalimer, but um, yeah, so they, they went into suckler farming then. And um, so I suppose growing up on a family farm, we would have been, you know, slightly involved. I might have stood in a gap or, do you know what I mean, helped, helped the parents to load up cattle. But that, that would be just about the, as much as I would have gotten involved in, um, in the early days of my life, I suppose. Uh, but after that, I, I would have went to university um, uh, I suppose growing up, we would have always have been encouraged to, you know, get our education um, and head off to school and whatever we wanted to do afterwards, be it a trade or a university. Um, so that's what I did. And um, I went to the University of Limerick then to uh, study nursing. And it's only when I met my now husband, Brian, really, that I got involved in farming again. And that was in 2014. And and talk through that, Deirdre, you mentioned, you know, going to UL and, and studying nursing, you know, what yeah. sort of a time scale did you spend through studying and working in nursing? So um, I went to university in 2005 and I would have completed my degree then in 2009. Um, and I suppose it was fortunate, but unfortunate at the time that it was, you know, the economic downturn, there was no nursing jobs and. Um, so I pretty much headed straight over to the UK after that. Um, I was just 21 when, when, I, when I left for the UK. And um, yeah, so I worked in um, a hospital called East Surrey Hospital, which is just south of London for two years and then moved up into London then after that. Um, and I remained there nursing up until 2015 when I returned home to Ireland. So, you know, you spent quite a time nursing, um, I suppose, you know, nearly a decade between your studies and, and, and working in the profession. Talk us through the decision that you made to change from a career in nursing to dairy farming. You know, you mentioned that, I suppose, prior to meeting Brian, you had very little, I suppose, ex- exposure to day to day farming. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, it, the extent of it might have been standing in a gap to, uh, to to move cows along their way. When when I met Brian, I was still living in the UK. And that was in 2014. And I moved home then uh, a year later in 15. Um, moved back to Galway. Now, I went into a job in nursing, obviously, straight away. Um, but I suppose the more I was farming with Brian in the, the weekends, the more I really got to enjoy it. And um, I, I suppose I it came natural to me. I, I just found it all very fascinating, really, <laughs> the whole dairy industry. And I really never knew it existed, to be honest with you. Um, so I just loved you know taking part in the weekends and eventually I worked up the courage into you know from walking the cows into to milking and I was probably measuring grass before I was milking cows realistically with Brian um at the weekends and um I suppose I wanted to upskill then um so I joined a new interest dairy farming uh, course in Chalkis then that was in Moorpark uh back in 2016 it was I think um, and that gave me great exposure as well. I joined a discussion group uh, subsequently to that. It would have been the, the Greenfield 3 group and I'm now a member of the Greenfield 2 group. Um, and, you know, I suppose I got great exposure that way and learned so much um, from Abigail there and all the other farmers who were new entrants at the time. Um, and then, you know, I would have done other professional courses like, um, I suppose I did the... Um, uh, hoof hoof pairing courses and any grassland courses and would have went to you know the the grassland conferences and and so on and and the dairy conferences just to kind of upscale while I was nursing so I mean my boss at the time was great um and I actually managed to get a half day 
so that I could, you know, do courses or, you know, when I was going down to Chagas Moor Park, she'd allow me work for, you know, extra long days for four days so that I could take a day off basically to go down to Cork. Um, so that, that flexibility was there for me, which was very useful at the time. So um, I suppose I was supported by my boss to do that. And um, really then, I suppose, making the decision, um, I probably had my mind made up for a long while that I wanted to do it full time, but it was about waiting for the opportunity where the business was in a position to support another income, really. Um, and that would have been when I, I made the move then in um uh, autumn of 2017 really because we were um i suppose just at the phase then when we were going to start uh calving down on the leased farm basically in in newquay in north clare um so that was the journey really and i suppose it's a continual journey the one thing i would say is i mean for anybody thinking about changing a career from anything into dairy farming is i suppose the nature of dairy farming um, nowadays you have to be good at everything you have to be a bit of an accountant you have to be you know a bit of a nurse maybe you know a bit of a vet you have to be good at everything really and I suppose the positive part of that is that you know if you have experience in another career you definitely have something that's transferable and that you can enjoy so for me cows and grass came naturally um machinery not as natural you know but that doesn't matter because somebody else can do that or it's something I can contract out some excellent points there Deirdre and I think you know what what you've talked about in the lead up to your change in career you armed yourself with a lot of knowledge and skill be it the new entrant course or practical practical courses on hoof pairing and grassland I really also like what you say like there are a lot of people who have moved from other uh, sectors and other careers into dairy farming and it's it's nice to highlight the fact that you know skills that you had as a nurse were transferable into farming you mentioned farming in north um, Clare and I suppose specifically the burn and when I when I think of daring, I don't necessarily think of the burn, um, uh, which which is um, you know maybe wrong on on my part. But can you tell us a little bit about the farm? You mentioned you started calving down there in in the spring of twenty eighteen. Yeah, so um, Brian uh, took on a lease on that farm in two thousand and seventeen, and we had the heifers there for a year. Um, and it was an existing dairy farm, um, a really, really fine farm. Now, I think um, they used to milk up to 200 cows there, I think, at the time. Um, so for us, uh, we put a bit of work into the place um, and would have upgraded the facilities, the milking facilities. And um, yeah, we calved down, I think it was 150 heifers on that block then in 2018, the spring of 2018, um, which was <laughs> quite a challenge. But I suppose to explain the farm in a little bit more detail, the, the ground in itself is excellent for growing grass. Um, you know, it's free drain and soil. We're out grazing there from the first of from the first of February, really. And um, we closed this year on the 20th of November and the cows weren't in uh, at all, like up until that point. Um, you know, last year we grew 17 ton there and this year we grew 18 and we haven't done a closing cover yet. So it's a great farm to grow grass. Um, and I suppose it's just the nature of the high rainfall coupled with the mild environment and the free draining soil. Um, and also we would have received it most of the farm now in the last kind of four years as well, which obviously, you know, um, is a big help too. Um, but the farm itself, you know, it's, I suppose, it's very unique and there, there are people milking in, in North Clare and there's lots of, you know, brilliant soccer farms as well. And um, it, it is just a, a very unique place, I suppose, in that there's the opportunity for the animals to stay out in the winter, up in the winter, just and uh, we're able to take advantage of that too, because we're, um, we're leasing a 40 hectare winterage as part of, of that farm. Um, whereby we can, you know, winter up to 25 cows really over the winter period. Um, so that's that's a really great advantage as well. And I suppose it has an advantage for the environment too, in that everything that the cows graze um, is an opportunity for, you know, the, the natural herbage to, to flourish really in the summer times in, in the barn, um, which is obviously world renowned for. Um, so I suppose it's a 
it's a good relationship between the cows and you know the, the winterage and what we can do to, to protect that environment. So so different, Deirdre, to to some of the the farmers we've we've heard from in terms of the 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 farm system that you're running. You know, when you talk about the the grazing, you know, there is added complication there. Um, above the the fact that you're you know you're growing a lot of grass and you know the the, the aim and the challenge for you is then to utilize it you know I suppose you're essentially managing two wedges a weekend wedge and then your your weekday wedge I, I guess another added complication is um, you know uh, getting cows across roads on the wild Atlantic way I'm sure now in peak summer that that isn't necessarily simple y- you mentioned two labor units to achieve that talk through the labor on that particular farm yeah you know you made some really good points there Emma Louise um you, you have it the, the nail on the head there really in terms of the challenges you know from the weekend raisins to the week raisins and um crossing the wild Atlantic way obviously with Covid the last two summers have been nice for us from a farming point of view that we can cross the road in peace but in general um tourists are very respectful of us when when we're crossing the road and um it's not what like we do it in dribs and drabs we're very um strategic and we you know we have a procedure for how we cross the cows and um they get across very quickly and in one group but um sorry just to get back to your point in terms of labor and um, so I suppose in the springtime, there's actually three of us there, you know, most of the time because we would calve down all the calf, all the cows for the two units on that farm, um, um, which would be, you know, the 270 cows um, we don't calve on, on our home block. So, um, so in the springtime, it's pretty full on there. I would do the majority of the calf rearing, um, which is, you know, it's you know, tough going, but we've made it as, you know, labor efficient as we possibly can with, you know, motorized kind of milk pumps and, and so on. Um, then uh, we're very, very lucky in that we have an excellent team around us there. So we have, um, we have two, um, let's say suckler farmers. So there's one suckler farmer and one um, suckler sheep farmer that, um, that work with us and it's, it works really well for us and it works quite well for them too in that they have the flexibility that if they have, you know, a problem with a cow calf and that they can just leave and go and deal with their problem and then come back to us. And um, it provides great flexibility that way. And we're quite flexible with them as well. If, you know, if they need to milk an hour later in the morning, then, you know, if they have to do that, that's fine. They'll just milk an hour later in the evening. And, you know, it, it just works well, I suppose, that way. Um, and just being able to provide that flexibility is definitely an advantage and it works well for, for both of us. And um, we also have um, a young guy who's, um, he's actually in secondary school, but he's, you know, he absolutely loves farming and everything to do with it. He's just the most natural farmer ever, but he's now milking cows at the weekend, um, which is super. And there's a college student as well, an engineer student who, who does relief. So there's a great team around us and, um, you know, um, we're, we're very lucky, really, I suppose, but it's all kind of, you know, yeah, you know, relationships have to be good, I suppose, and it's just about respect, I think, and, you know, um, and I think that's why it works for us, and, you know, Brian and myself are full-time. At the moment, I'm on maternity leave, we've got a four-month-old baby, but, um, you know, I, I'm still aware of exactly what's happening on the farm as well at all times, and, um you know, have have certainly still have my toe in and um, know what's going on. But um, yeah, so that's our labour, really. It's really, really interesting, Deirdre. And um, I would have spoken previously with um, a student from Chagas. He's he's now a a teacher at Palace Kenry, Eamon O'Flaherty, and he actually did research and he looked at um, the opportunity that exists for dry stock farmers to work on dairy farms and I think you know exactly what your his findings were is what you're implementing you know there's a huge amount of respect and you're satisfying your needs in terms of your need for labor but also their need for flexibility you know obviously as a suckler farmer there may be a situation where they do need to get home to assist a cow so exactly exactly what you're saying another interesting point Deirdre you made was in relation to uh, winter grazing or winterage can you tell us a little bit about that yeah so um 
So there, as I mentioned, there's 40 hectares there of winch region and as part of the dairy farm. Um, so I suppose to explain it a little bit better, it's like um it's it's a limestone pavement. Um all right, what we're particularly what we're farming in is a bit of a hill or a mountain, we call it, but it's it's more of a hill really, and it would be made up of I would say maybe 55% rock and then the remainder is um, grass then that grows throughout the year. So natural herbitage, we, we don't add any fertilizer to that ground whatsoever. Um, and we're not allowed to feed silage on the ground either, um, just so that we can encourage the animals or the, the cows to graze down. Um, so we're part of the burn program. And um, as far as I'm aware, the burn program is the, the first local led scheme and, you know, it's really paving the way for all the rest of the, the schemes that are going to be coming in down the line in the future um, and has won, you know, many awards um, internationally um, for, I suppose, its innovation. So, um, I suppose, to, to explain it, basically, I suppose it's a practice that's been uh, in place for thousands of years where the farmers um, would send the animals uh, into the winterage over the winter time and they'd winter there, eat the, eat the grasses that had developed from throughout the year and um, uh, cleaning, cleaning off the limestone pavement. So when it came to springtime and summertime, um, uh, there was enough heat and enough light for all the natural uh, flowers basically to grow um, in the winterage and these flowers are really unique to the area um, it's the only place in the world where arctic and mediterranean um, flowers grow um, together side by side basically um, and you know i suppose it's unique to anywhere else in the world but it's because of the farmers that you know those flowers are still there because because of their farming practice so that's why it's been encouraged to, to keep it up um so that the so that the ground doesn't become overgrown it's important for it to be grazed every winter so um i suppose to explain the scheme a little bit better we basically um get scored from one to ten um in terms of how well we've managed the winterage over the winter and we get paid accordingly so you don't get paid um if it scored less than six, um, basically, and they like to see that it's improving year on year as well. So um, they're, they're, it's quite a simple system. Like it's, you know, it's, it's not difficult to get your head around, but <laughs> like you laugh at me, the first time we put cows up there, it was so alien to me that I actually put holy water on them <laughs> because I was like, what am I doing sending dairy cows up this hill? Um, but they did fantastic, you know, and um, it's just, you know about herding them and making sure they're okay and everything but like we've had no injuries that they're perfectly warm and healthy up there um but i suppose for us we generally don't winter the cows let's say from november to january or february up there what we do is um when we dry off the cows we send them up there for maybe 10 days seven to ten days after we've dried them off and um, just because it's a nice clean dry area for them to lie down and there's no dirt um, and it just helps to reduce I suppose the mastitis and improve the, the drying off period um, but then the, the later calvers then such as the, the April calvers um, we'll, we'll put them up and um, they, they can be wintered up there then you know what I mean from you know whenever we do our last dry off let's say um, but we're all we're always mindful of of minerals as well. I suppose that we we get that into them, so we we'll, we we'll bring them down in time to get their pre-calf and minerals in as well. Yeah, that's it really. I suppose in a in a nutshell. <laughs> so another aspect of the farm you mentioned a second unit. So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the decision to move to a second unit and also how it has impacted on the overall farm business? Yeah, so we started um, milking on uh, our own owned platform in Clarenbridge this April. Um, so we were, I suppose, busy getting that up and running this springtime as well as uh, calving in, in Clare. But um, so that's a 60 or 36 hectare block in Clarenbridge. And um, I suppose the decision to go about setting up that unit was made for a number of reasons. And um, I suppose the biggest one was so that we would have something of our own really. And it was important for us that we would have, you know, milking facilities of our own on our own land. And that, you know, that that, that, that is there for us. And um, so we're milking 88 of the mature cows uh, on that platform. Um, in terms of how it has impacted our business, from a labor point of view, um, you know, it's extremely efficient. And I think that's really, I suppose, um, 
you know, straight away, we, we, we knew, I suppose, going into it, but I, I think it has been confirmed pretty quickly that because of the efficiencies that are there, you know, it was definitely um, the right decision to, to convert it into um, a, a working dairy. Um, we have a 22 unit uh, parlor there with cluster removers and um, we have a herring bone crush. Uh, I mean, I can I calculated the hours working on the farm, and on average, I would say it's about um, three to four hours a day, seven days a week. So, I mean, it's not even a full time job, really. That would be including doing a grass walk and setting up wires, um, because the milking is so efficient, um, and also because of the nature of it, the cows don't have far to walk, which is the exact stark contrast to the farm in Clare. Um, the cows can really just concentrate on eating grass, lying down and making milk, you know. Um, so, you know, we've been very happy with the, with the cows there this year. Um, and so we're delighted with the, the decision to, move to, to, to convert it, I suppose. From April onwards, I was managing that up until the time when I had to take off, you know, on maternity leave. But then we we had, as I said, a local um, suckler and sheep farmer who was doing some um, milk and there with us as well and a student at the weekends um, kind of later in the year so um, you know I, I won't say it's easy to find um, people to, uh, you know to work on farms but we, we've been very lucky that you know the people that we have found are you know are brilliant and they're just natural farmers so it, it works well for us. And that 22 units Deirdre like I mean for 88 cows it's it's a hugely efficient system but a big cost you know o- over the number of cows that are milking there do you see that farm expanding cow numbers wise in the future? No, I don't. Definitely not. Um, <laughs> I suppose it's very efficient, but um, you know, we still we have twenty two units in the, in the farm in the burn too, and that's as, as efficient as it can be. Also, but obviously the milk takes longer down there, you know. So we have one hundred and eighty cows in in the farm in the burn, and we we milk eighty eight cows then in Clarence Bridge. So it's four rows. Um, I know you might say it's a big expense for what it is, but you know. I suppose we're very happy, as I said, with the cow, cow's production and, you know, this year they, they really produce between, you know, hopefully 490 and 500 kilos. So um, we hope that over time, you know, by putting in the right facilities, um, we'll save it in labour costs definitely, but, you know, that the cows will have the opportunity just to, to you know, to make the money back, I suppose. Absolutely. The return on investment there in terms of the, the, the offset labour cost is is definitely a big saving. I suppose, Deirdre, part of my um, my idea of having the conversation with you today was, you know, I, I observed um, your, your big success as Chaga Student of the Year um, back in July. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and what you took from it? Yeah, um yeah, no, God, I don't know what to say. Um, I was shocked, really, to be honest. Um, so to explain it, I suppose, uh, one of the lecturers in Pellaskinnery phoned me, um, you know, I think it was two months prior, uh, Rachel, and, you know, told me that I'd been chosen as their student of the year, and I was shocked because I didn't really know, you know, we hadn't really heard much about it. And, you know, and then they explained that they were putting me forward for the Chalk Student of the Year. So... <laughs> Like I knew what I was putting myself up for then, you know, it was a real challenge, you know, when you're putting yourself forward against, you know, some of the best students in the country from all the other agricultural colleges. So um, it was good for me, the competition in that, you know, it really gave me the opportunity to sit down and evaluate everything in our business so that I'd be prepared for the interview process, which was, you know, it was a real challenge. And, you know, there's no point in, in saying that it wasn't. Um, you know, but it's great. And I suppose for me, I like to be challenged. And maybe that's why I love dairy farming so much, because it is a challenge and there's always something new to be um, to be challenged by. There's always something that you can, you know, to strive to improve. So um, I suppose, you know, I was determined to do my best, definitely. But obviously, I was still very surprised and delighted to have won the award. Um, Looking to the future and, and you say, you know, there's always something new and it is a challenging, challenging working environment, you know, looking to the future, where do the priorities or focus areas lie for you and Brian for your dairy farm business? Uh, for the business, I would say um, we're not going to expand cow numbers. To, um, for definitely not. I think we're, we're, we're kind of at the max there at the moment at our 270. So I would say our focus is going to be on uh, soil fertility and indexes. Um, we worked on that this autumn then in that, you know, I took samples last um, 
last early spring, I think it was um, late December or January. And so we put two ton of lime out where we needed to and a ton, um, you know, where it wasn't required just to try and, you know, get the, get the soil working. And we have a, an awful lot of the farms reseeded. Um, we'll, we've now started reseeding the, the heifer block, which is, you know, 20 minutes away, that's 68 hectares of ground. Um, and that's an east farm as well. So we'll probably focus on getting that um, to be more productive. But also, I suppose, incorporating clover into our swords, definitely, and managing that better. So I think we need to just upskill them. You know, we're great at managing perennial ryegrass. Well, I won't say we're great, but, you know, we're, we're managing it to the best of our ability and we're growing grass. But I think it's important for us now to, to focus on how we can, I suppose, grow clover and, and incorporate that into the cow's diet, you know, um, down the line and, you know, get a bit better at that so that, you know, just to make our business more resilient into the future and, and you know, become less dependent on nitrogen. So uh, they would be our biggest focus areas, I would say. And then, you know, obviously anything environmental that's coming down the way, I, you know, we are doing a lot for the environment as it is, but obviously we're always open for, you know, to new challenges. And if there's anything else that we can improve on, we'd definitely be doing that as well. And I, I think your points, um, you know, to, to wrap up in terms of the future, future areas, you know, it's very much, um, you know, the basics of what you're doing, you know, as a grassland farmer, ensuring that for soil fertility is at its optimum and, and then obviously receding and focusing on the, the clover to reduce reliance on nitrogen. And, and it is that thing of being being brilliant at the basics it gets you a long way it's been really insightful to hear about your journey into dairy farming Deirdre and very encouraging for anyone listening in today who is actually considering it and, and I suppose um, a boost for people who have made the jump like yourself thank you Deirdre thank you Louise. that's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast and my thanks to Deirdre McMahon for joining me on this week's show don't forget to rate review and subscribe to the podcast You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.